Hi, I want to start by offering a definition of what public mental health interventions are. Um, these are interventions designed to prevent the emergence of mental health disorders, ensure access to needed treatments, and to prevent the emergence of the associated impacts of mental disorders, uh, for example, on families or coworkers and communities, um, and doing all of this with a focus on the mental health of populations. And I should acknowledge that the work I'm describing is being done with a really uh, wide range of partners including UVM colleagues, the Vermont Departments of Health and Mental Health, and with funding from the CDC and US Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. So suicide accounts for the majority of firearm deaths, uh, both in Vermont and in the US. And in Vermont, they're involved in about 55% of suicide deaths every year. And there's several reasons why focusing on firearm suicide prevention makes a lot of sense uh, beyond the fact that they're the most commonly used means. One of the reasons is that their lethality is really high. Um, so about 90% of suicide attempts by firearm result in death. And uh, firearm injuries are not generally medically reversible, which is unlike some other suicide um, attempt methods. Firearms are also really commonly available. Um, and in Vermont, almost half of households have one or more firearm in the household. Um, so that's something that we, we really have to pay attention to. Also, suicide attempts can be really impulsive. They can be very short-term decisions. And one of the strategies that's been supported um, is introducing delays through firearm safe storage practices. And these are things like using pistol safes, uh, trigger locks, and the best practices are actually storing firearms unloaded, locked up with the ammunition locked separately. Um, and these have all been shown to reduce suicide deaths, as well as making accidental shootings, homicides, and theft of firearms less likely. So one public health informed approach that we're supporting in Vermont is having a wide variety of healthcare uh, providers ask, using uh, neutral and acceptable language about safe storage of firearms in the home and then when it's needed, um, having conversations about how to store firearms more safely. Doing this requires that providers have basic knowledge about self-storage, many of them do not. Um, it also requires having confidence and competence in having the actual conversation. So using neutral language and language that's not likely to um, alienate the firearm owner. This is something that my colleague, uh, Dr. Rebecca Bell at the UVM MC Pediatric Intensive Care Unit and myself have been working on, and we've actually developed a self-directed um, e-learning module, uh, really brief, about 13 minutes. So it's designed for busy providers and busy people. And um, what it does is it provides really basic um, tools and skills, and it models how to have these conversations. So we're also promoting the adoption of the CALM training, which is Counseling on Access to Lethal Means, uh, means which is uh, it's an online self-directed uh, training. It's free and it takes between one and a half and two hours. So it's a lot more in depth than the one that myself and Dr. Bell developed, but we also think it's really important and uh, many providers will um, avail themselves of the opportunity to do that training we expect. So we are tracking learning outcomes from these trainings as well as um, self-reported firearm storage practices at the level of the population using different surveys. Um, our expectation is that as more providers start having these safe storage conversations with their patients, we should see an uptick in people reporting that their firearms are safely stored. And way downstream, uh, we'd really like to see reductions in suicide attempts and suicide deaths. Um, and that's really it. I hope that, I hope that I've um, helped people understand a little bit more about some of our public mental health efforts as they relate to firearm suicide prevention. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Delaney. We do have, and maybe as we're jumping over to um, Dr. Grout's presentation here, um, Tom, we do have a request to put a link to the safe storage training, um, yes. perhaps, so that would be wonderful. And, and yeah. we'll certainly, um, all our folks who are joining us today, we will send this recording out um, and we will share any of those links that folks are referencing today too. So thank you so much, Nicholas, for asking that. And Dennis, we'll get to your question a little bit later in the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Delaney. So I wanna toss it over to Leah. Leah, why don't you, uh, gosh, I feel like the title of this one might frighten a lot of people <laughs> thinking of future pandemics, but I have no doubt that is what 
as experts in public health, you are always preparing and thinking about how as a, as a community we can prepare for what might be next. So I'll, I'll toss it over to you, please. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, this is a topic that I think a lot of people wish would just go away. Um, but in the public health world, we need to be thinking about how to continue to um, respond to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and how to prepare and manage future pandemics. So there are a lot of ongoing impacts that we're keeping an eye on, including morbidity and mortality. Globally, there have been over 6.7 million reported deaths so far, although the real number is probably much higher. Also, an estimated 10.5 million children have lost a parent or caregiver to this pandemic, and this puts them at increased risk of abuse, exploitation, poor education, and poor health outcomes. In terms of morbidity, as many as one in eight patients may show symptoms of long COVID, and there also appears to be a dose-response relationship between the number of reinfections with COVID-19 and poor health outcomes. So this is something we're going to be dealing with for quite a while. There are also some important healthcare system impacts. Uh, workforce shortages and delays in care could have long-lasting impacts. For example, as of June 2020, it was estimated that 41% of U.S. adults delayed or avoided medical care, and that includes both emergency and routine care. And this delay in care could lead to increases in issues um, associated with both acute and chronic health conditions going forward. Uh, there are some very important economic and social impacts that, that really impact human health and well-being. Uh, the World Bank estimates that globally 97 million people were pushed into poverty due to COVID-19, and many of those are living on less than $2 a day. There have also been substantial social impacts, many that we've all um, experienced, including social isolation and loneliness, and those can have potentially serious health consequences as well. The pandemic has also exacerbated inequities. Uh, for example, in the U.S., Indigenous, Black, and Hispanic or Latino persons were at least two times more likely to be hospitalized than white persons and more than 1.5 times more likely to die from COVID-19. This is also a, a global issue. Um, for example, uh, vaccine inequity remains a big issue. As of July 2022, Africa was averaging at around 19% of the population fully vaccinated in comparison to 69% of the global population. So unfortunately, the risk of pandemics is increasing rapidly and is driven by anthropogenic ecological disruption. Um, around 70% of emerging diseases, for example, Ebola, and almost all pandemics are zoonoses, meaning that they are diseases that are spread from animals to humans. And unfortunately, evidence suggests that there's a high probability that we'll observe pandemics similar to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and that probability of experiencing it in our lifetimes is currently around 38%, according to some recent modeling. But that may double in coming decades as we encroach on wild spaces and alter the environment. And we have increased uh, globalization, um, think the amount of air traffic and how that was impacted by this pandemic. As that gets going again, we're going to continue to have to watch the spread of infectious diseases. So this is something that an area that we need to continue to focus on to plan and prepare for future pandemics. So that's really what I had for the moment. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Right, let's take a look at another topic that is uh, on the mind. I know of everybody in public health and looking at the overall health of our community. Um, Dr. Khan, I'm gonna toss this over to you. Make sure you unmute um, so that we can hear you and I'll follow along with your presentation to help illustrate um, the slides as well. Go for it. Thank you very much. And yes, I'm Shamima Khan and I'll be talking about today the current state of obesity in the United States. And first I'd like to say that um, the obesity pandemic right now is a global issue. And it is not just in the United States, but my presentation today is focused on the United States. So um, the question is, what is obesity? Obesity is when our BMI is 30 kilogram 
per meter square are higher. That's how we define obesity. The data I'm presenting today for this study was collected by BRFSS. It is basically a statewide data collection system uh, where CDC, Center for Disease Control, works together. And the data is basically self-reported. So individuals report their height and weight from which we tend to calculate our, the system, BRFSS, calculates the BMI. Now, there were some changes implemented in 2011 in terms of BRSSS methodological issues, and that's why my data today is going to start from 2011, and it's going to end at 2021. But we are going to go through it quite fast, so it's not going to take too much time. But what I do want um, all of us to be mindful of as we are going through these years is to kind of take a look at the colors and how the colors are changing in the United States. So with that, I'd like to start with 2011. So 2011, I'm just gonna point a couple of things here. As you can see, there are 10 states and DC right now green. And as we move forward over the years, that will sadly start changing. So let's go. So less and less green and more and more other colors. And it's more and more red, and eventually we are even getting to maroon, which is really sad, Mississippi. And now finally we are in 2021. So over the 10 years, what are the main, uh, for me, the changes that I really, really noted was the fact that the green is no longer evident in any of the states. So we started with 10 states. Now none of the states are green. We only have DC as green. So that is very troubling. And two states right now are basically deep, deep red or maroon. The current state of obesity has reached a point where many public health professionals as well as physicians are saying, next to smoking, this is the most or the biggest threat to our healthcare system as well as our public health system. So currently, what is the situation? Um, as I said in summary, 2011, this is where we at. No state or territory has a prevalence less than 20%. And DC is the only one that has between 20 to 25%. And then we have eight states um, with a prevalence of obesity between 25 to less than 30%. So basically the situation is pretty dire. And uh, now the question is, as public health advocates, what can be done to address the situation? We don't want this to be something where it becomes a negative body image issue and individuals start abusing their bodies and become involved with uh, all kinds of abusive anorexia, bulimia type of situation. But at the same time, a healthy conversation about how to deal with obesity needs to happen. And I think that's where I'd like to leave my presentation with. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting and alarming. Thank you very much. I'm going to toss now over to our final presentation, Dr. Carney. Um, you're uh, stepping in to health politics, which <laughs> bravely stepping into the topic of health politics. Why don't you take us away, Jan? Oh, thank you very much, Nicole. Well, it feels like in the pandemic, you know, we, we those of us working in public health, we work in an environment and we work with policymakers. And in public health, we have, we do a lot of education and, and work with programs, do research. And one of the things we either advise or very involved in is policy. And, and that might look like um, more funding or a law or regulation or restriction of some kind. And that's where the controversy comes in. So this has been an area, you know, during the pandemic when we had our things were shut down, um, there were requirements or restrictions where some of the real tensions and struggles came to be. So you can see on the left, I put in a link to an article that was in Florida about the anti-mask the anti mandate protests. And you can see that cancel mask. 
And so, and and we remember some of the news reports of of people being unhappy about wearing masks on on airplanes, for example. And so, things that required people to do things, or was really um, a rule or a law or a restriction or a requirement in some ways, created a lot of tension. And we and we all have watched that. So you know from someone who has practiced public health for many years, but also in our educational role and in our role to inform people about the evidence base and the science of public health, how might we think about it? So I put in another article for everyone, and this was from pre-pandemic, it's from 2016, but it was one of the really best short papers that I could find that talks about, gives us a perspective about that. Um, because we really can't in public health in the entire policy realm, we really can't shy away from it. Let me step back and say, you know, sometimes it's helpful to, to have a long view. What do I mean? Look at the successes in public health history that have resulted in improvements in health and the well-being of so many people. And just a couple of examples to keep in perspective for when we do have some of these controversial areas. And that is things like, you know, um, we we had so much more dental caries, dental decay among children before not only access to dental care, but also fluoride and safely putting fluoride in some public drinking water supplies. So some of those advances. And at the time, those were controversial and they remain controversial today. Our progress around vaccines and not just the requirement for vaccines for school entry, which protects individual children and then all the other children and the other people working in an educational environment, but also the programs, particularly the federal vaccine uh, for children program that opened up the door to making them more accessible and available to children in our country. The tobacco use and smoking is a great example of policy, the impact, positive impact on public health and policy. And think about when we used to, they used to allow smoking in indoor spaces. Now we don't do that anymore. And there were price increases for tobacco products, which really um, help prevent young people from starting to smoke cigarettes. All of those things happened over time. They were all at the time accompanied by great controversy, but it was the role of public health advocates and public health professionals using the research and science and evidence working in partnership with policymakers that really created a better environment for health. Um, lead poisoning prevention, everything from taking the lead out of gasoline to efforts to make older rental housing safer, particularly for young children, also through the environment, but also through screening and education for parents. That, that has been a huge help. Um, mandates for seatbelts have reduced motor vehicle fatalities and the highway safety measures to change the environment of driving have also um, improved and reduced injuries there. We had an environmental awakening in the 70s that resulted in legislation for clean water and air and prevention of exposure to some toxic substances. And I think it's important to remember that now that did not happen overnight, particularly in the conversations and challenges that we have around climate change and climate science. Um, many other examples. I guess my, my point is that to remember that these are very challenging, require work over time, requiring using that evidence and working in partnership with many groups, organizations, and with policymakers in legislative or sometimes congressional uh, arenas, and that these areas have the potential to improve health and lives of many, many people. There is in this article, and you'll see the chart on the right side of the slide, which is some, some tips for us, which are to understand 
the non-science factors that are involved in policymakers' decisions. And, and the way to do that is to talk with them and to develop those relationships, not just in the controversy of the issue, but on an ongoing basis. And here in Vermont, my experience has been and continues to be that they are very receptive to having those conversations. And that continues to be one of the reasons for our great success here, not only in terms of the pandemic, but on a wide range of public health and healthcare related issues. And you can see the rest of the list. Um, for us, uh, understand that environment, learn about political science. That's something that we talk about as, are there things that we can do to help our students be more comfortable rather than just saying, no, I, I'm really um, afraid of getting involved in this in any way. So that's my sort of efforts to kind of demystify um, the politics a little bit, but also to say, despite the fact that how challenging it is and can be, it's so essential for us to be knowledgeable and work together. Thank you, Jan. Thank you all of you for these insights into what you're keeping an eye on um, for what we kind of deem some hot topics for this year. Um, I want to toss it over to the audience. We do have a couple questions um, and just giving you an opportunity to kind of absorb what, what our presenters just shared and if there's any additional questions that you may have. Um, Jan, I was wondering maybe if you might um, be able to answer the question from Danielle. Um, Danielle writes, regardless of the pandemic, access and wait times for care has become increasingly difficult across many sectors. While the pandemic exacerbated the issues and burnt out a lot of staff, what are some solutions to increasing providers? Um, and then there's, a, there's another, um, I, I guess this would also kind of supplement that question. In Vermont, wait times for specialties are exceeding six to 12 months. While it's good to recognize the phenomenon, what are some of the suggestions, either from increasing providers or or any other suggestions that you may have? That's, that is something that, that um, healthcare and public health officials are working very hard on right now. And it is always challenging, particularly in the rural parts of our state, and just speaking for Vermont, but it has been, um, it has been especially challenging in the recent past. You know, one of the things that during the pandemic, one of the bright spots, if, if we can describe it that way, was the increasing use of telehealth. And telemedicine. And that is something that um, many people are saying that what is the role for that? And then can that help us in the long term, again, particularly in our rural areas? I would say that for, for individuals who have a relationship with a primary care physician or primary care health professional to rely on that person as much as you can. And here at the UVM Medical Center, people have a, a health portal that they can use to communicate but to pay particularly attention, not so much to the specialty care, but to that primary care. And so that you can prioritize the most important things for yourself to stay healthy. Great, thank you, Jan. And thank you, Danielle, for asking that question. Um, I wanna get to Dennis's question here um, and I'll, I'll supplement um, some of the response, Dennis, for you with some information here. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, everyone on this presentation today is part of our teaching faculty um, for our Master of Public Health program. And so I just wanted to take a few minutes to, to really share what is that program. Um, if you're interested in learning more about public health or, or maybe, maybe you work in the field and you wanna augment um, your education with that master's degree um, in public health, this is a program that we wanna share with you. Jan, I just want you to, obviously we're, we don't need to read all the bullets, but just give kind of an overview of what is UVM's master of public health program and we'll talk about the areas of excellence next. Yeah, let me just say a few words and I would invite my faculty colleagues to jump right in um, to highlight any of the, things from your perspective, but we are a nationally accredited through the Council on Education for Public Health, Master of Public Health program. So that requires 42 graduate credits. And we're a strong generalist program, meaning that our faculty are committed to preparing our graduates for a wide range of public health careers and feeling both very comfortable and very versatile in working in public health in a variety of different ways. Um, we have 
three broad areas of excellence. We have many faculty, both full-time faculty and part-time faculty who have expertise in many areas. These are our broad areas of excellence. And uh, would any of the other faculty like to, to make a comment or two? If you do, just don't forget to unmute. Anyone wants to jump in? Sure, I can jump in. Um, I think one of the things I also have an MPH and I, although I did it many years ago, what I found was that with a good grounding in both the quantitative side of things, the epidemiology and the biostatistics, but also you get introduced to uh, policy and um, a whole bunch of other topics. It does let you go into a variety of different fields um, that are related to public health, and you can always specialize later with a strong foundation if that's something you're interested in, and that's something that I found in my own career to be helpful. Great, and we do have an article that we'll be publishing um, probably next week featuring Leah and her background, so keep an eye out for that too. Um, we're very happy to have you on board, Leah. Thank you for that, both Jan and Leah. And just a few quick slides, you know, if this is something you're interested in, please reach out to us at learn at uvm.edu. We have advisors standing by. We also have um, live people, real people on the other end of the chat um, functionality of our website. So you're not talking to um, a computer on the other side. There are our enrollment coaches answering chat questions. So if you have a quick question, um, you can jump on the website and, and click that chat box. And then you're more than welcome to email and, and set up an appointment with one of our advisors specifically in our public health program. Um, and just a couple admissions requirement that you can see there as well. And then the application process is it is an online application looking for that personal statement, letters of recommendation, transcripts, um, and resume as well. Um, and just looking ahead to some of those dates, if this is something you're interested in, um, summer has a rolling admission. Um, and then there's, you see the other dates late summer, um, to apply for fall and then December to apply for spring um, would be 2024. I did want to make note, because we, we certainly could have um, some students with us, some UVM undergrad students with us, or, or maybe you have an undergrad student at UVM that might be interested in adding the accelerated Master of Public Health program um, to, to their um, curriculum at UVM. Jan, maybe could you unmute for just a second and just describe that program? It's been growing so much, and it's so wonderful to see our undergrad population um, um, adding on a Master of Public Health as they're completing um, essentially five years at UVM. Can you just explain what that is? Yes, and, and thank you, Nicole. And for students who apply in their junior year and they know they want to get a Master of Public Health, they can start that process and uh, complete both their bachelor's and their master's in five years. You know, what happens there? They're able to take two to three of our graduate public health courses when they're a senior with the approval and blessing of their academic advisor and they double count. So students save time and money and are able to complete both these degrees. And as you mentioned, this is a program that's been very popular here at UVM and, are not, and the number of students um, applying for that has, has been growing. And again, they go out and and um, start in the workforce of, of public health um, right after that. Yeah, and, and I think Leah alluded to it as well. There, the career opportunities are so broad and so diverse um, with a master's degree in public health. Um, I did wanna come back to Dennis's question. Dennis was asking about scholarship funding um, for master's students and, and there is financial aid available. The, the best um, approach will probably look, look on our website, which I'll, I'll put over here for just a second. An easy one to go to is gouvm.edu and you can um, do the forward slash public health. You can absolutely talk to one of our advisors. Again, you can chat on the website or you can reach out um, through our public health site to speak with Vika, um, who would be the advisor to talk about different financial aid options. But your second part of your question is the format is 100% online. Um, and so Jan, I thought maybe you could just address this for a moment because um, our program didn't transition online. Mm -hmm. You started the Master of Public Health program at University of Vermont's College of Medicine. You started the program online. Why did you do that? And then how has it evolved, I think, to meet the needs of students today? Well, the short answer is the students wanted it. 
And, and so when we were starting, students wanted the flexibility. Sometimes, sometimes they did not want to just do the program full time. They wanted to be working part time or sometimes they're working full time and taking the program part time and any combination. So we have a wide range of students from those accelerated students in at UVM undergrads all the way through to people who are have been working in public health or healthcare or research or even some of our faculty have gone through our program and so it really varies. It gives them flexibility. Um, I would let I would invite any of our faculty to speak about how we engage our students in an online community because our faculty uh, get outstanding reviews for their teaching. They use innovative strategies to have discussions and come up with new ways to engage our students um, in, in our courses. So uh, Leah or Tom or Shamima, please jump right in, help me out here. I would say the, the most visible thing and that's been um, sort of transformative for some of the courses is using Yellow Dig. Um, so yellow yellow dig is um it's like a discussion board on steroids and it's um it's a very interactive engaging way for students to interact with each other about the course content and bring in other aspects of like their work or their personal interests um and it it doesn't have to be moderated by an instructor or a ta but sometimes the instructor or the ta will be joining in and sharing about their own professional experiences and perspectives um, I really like it because it often brings a lot of current events and um, people also have like a, a lot of people are in our program are already working in some aspect related to public health. And so they're bringing in stuff about their work at a county health department in North Carolina or, you know, some disease prevention program in Maine. And um, it really leads to more rich conversation than, than we uh, sadly they, they end at the end of the semester, but oftentimes we couldn't revisit those topics in future courses as well. Great. Didn't know if anyone else wants to chime in on maybe Leah. I know what you've been so gracious in answering questions, but as a new faculty member, um, how has been that that opportunity to engage with students in an online platform? Have you found that accessible and exciting? Yeah, it's been really interesting because I it's been my I just finished my first semester with the program and I've had the great pleasure of meeting with students all across not only the country, but the world. Some of them are here in Vermont, but we've had students who have joined. You know, we we try to be very accessible to students um, and offer meetings when we can, and and work around different time zones if we have to. We had a student who was in the UK, and we had another student who was in Africa for a while, and they bring a, their own unique perspective to to the course and that's a learning opportunity for for everyone including me and I really enjoy getting to hear those perspectives but so we have a variety of ways to interact whether it's through a discussion board you know we make ourselves available for for synchronous meetings to help students you know whenever we can and there are all sorts of ways to get to get that interaction in this in this very flexible format great thank you Thanks so much, everyone, for your questions today. I see they've quieted down. Um, and so we won't keep anyone any longer. We know there's plenty to do as you probably kick off the new year. Um, thank you, Jan, Leah, Tom, and Shamima for joining us and sharing some of the things that are on your radar um, for public health work and our community health as we look into this new year of 2023. Um, best wishes to everyone. Happy New Year. And thank you so much for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Take care. Thank you.